hallelujah, there is certainly an atmosphere in this place that anything can happen tonight. Can you say amen? amen? God bless you. You may return to your seat. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Jaron, for an awesome keynote. Amen. And on behalf of Bishop and Sister James Carney and Pastor Jaron and uh, Pastor and Sister Jaron Carney and Woodlawn, we welcome you to Impact, Columbia, Mississippi. Amen. And uh, their doors swing on welcome hinges, and they want you to know you're welcome here. I want to uh, acknowledge some special guests. When I call your name, if you would stand, and then if the congregation withhold your applause, we would uh, let these folks know we appreciate them being here with one round of applause. We're so glad to have Judge Prentice Harrell here tonight. Also on the platform, we have Brother Carl McLaughlin. He is the presbyter of the Texas District and the president of Texas Bible College. We have the Assembly of the Lord Jesus Christ, General Superintendent, Brother Kenneth Carpenter. We have our uh, General North American Mission Secretary, Brother Bill Hobson. We have our General Sunday School Director, Brother Steve Cannon. We have two district superintendents, Brother Wayne Huntley from North Carolina, Brother Jack Cunningham from Virginia. Amen. And we have our district secretary, Brother Dennis Davis, and a host of other friends. Would you give these folks a round of applause? We're so glad they're here this evening. Amen. Somebody say it's offering time. The Bible is a cheerful giver. Now I want you to smile and look at somebody and say it's offering time. Before we receive tonight's offering, I want to say that we are excited about all that God wants to do in this place over the next few days. Thank you so much. Amen. If you've heard me preach more than once, you have heard me say that I don't believe in global warming. That I am more concerned about global whining. However, I've had a change of heart. After a lot of thought, I do believe in global warming. I do believe that there are some changes happening in our atmosphere. The temperature of the earth is getting warmer and warmer. The ozone layer is getting thinner and thinner. Something is going on. And the Word of God tells us in Joel 2.28, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show you wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and global warming, I mean, and fire and pillars of smoke. I believe that the atmosphere is just warming up for God to do something. Now, as the ushers begin to receive the offering this evening, I'm reminded of that song that Magruder sang many years ago. I'm just warming up. I'm just warming up. I'm just warming up. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm just warming up. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see, this warming trend that I'm talking about in the spiritual atmosphere tends to create the greenhouse effect. Everybody say green. So by that I mean that the green stuff in your wallet and your purse is trying to escape and change the atmosphere in this building. Everybody say, I'm going to help. God is warming the spiritual atmosphere in our world today, and we have a chance to give to make an impact. The ushers are going to wait on you now. Don't ever feel that you can't give to the kingdom of God and help in advance. Everyone has a role to play no one is exempt from the opportunity to contribute. I'm reminded before I pray of a story of Susan B. Anthony who called the famous newspaper editor Horace Greeley. One day in 1860, she called to ask for his newspaper support of women's suffrage. Greeley was not sympathetic. He was an, uh, an opponent of women's suffrage, mainly because he considered women to be of no military value. He asked her, what would you do in the event of a civil war? I would do just what you do, she replied. I would sit in my office and write articles urging other people to go fight. So 
in this setting and in this atmosphere, everybody can participate. Amen. Everybody say, I will give. I surrender all. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your presence and your power. Thank you for the opportunity to give and make an impact in a life-changing atmosphere in this place tonight. Now bless this offering, and we'll be quick to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. The choir is coming to sing. Amen. I mean, believe there's a healer in the house.
Somebody shout, freedom is here. Oh, there's a healing in this place. Hallelujah. Freedom is here. atmosphere is set for healing tonight God's spirit is in this place and great things are going to happen I have had this scripture on my heart all day and I believe the Lord dropped it there so I could share with you before our speaker comes and it speaks of the great work that God wants to accomplish through us and in us this evening Matthew 13 16 and 17 but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them many of our forefathers and prophets our grandparents long for the day that you and I are experiencing that I believe can even is the inauguration of what God wants to do this week. Anything can happen in this place. Anything. Signs, wonders, healings, miracles of all kind because the atmosphere is right. Brother, Pastor Jared mentioned my mother and what a legacy I have of a praying mom. And 14 years ago, she was diagnosed with a melanoma tumor behind her eye. She was told she would live no longer than five years. That was 14 years ago, and my mom is shouting that God is a healer. My son asked me to preach last Sunday in Grenada, and we had such a deep move of the Spirit, and there was a hunger for the Spirit in that place. And he came up to me after the service and said, Dad, I felt that God was, is leading our church into a season of miracles. Well, the very next day, and then, of course, a couple of days after that, but things began to happen. But the very next day, it just seemed like we were hit in the face with a couple of things. And one of our granddaughters, who couldn't be here tonight, but she'd been diagnosed with a blood disorder and may need a blood, a blood transfusion. And my grandson, Cade, who's here tonight, has for a couple of months had a chronic cough. And, and they've scheduled him to go to Le Bonner's, I think, Thursday. He's been having trouble breathing. But after we made that declaration Sunday, I said to my son and to my family, I don't even view this as an attack of the enemy. I believe it is an opportunity for God to get glory. I still believe that this is a season of miracles. We are in that season. Somebody say, it's my season. The atmosphere is right. The waters is troubled. It is time for everybody in this room to activate our faith. Activate our faith and to receive what God wants for us. I have come tonight for my miracle. Somebody shout, yes. I have come to see the healing power of God work in my family's life. Somebody shout, my life. We are blessed this evening. The things that our elders long to see and hear will be happening in this place tonight. I've always believed that, and I believe that when the time was right, God always sends the right man. Tonight, we are blessed to have the Lee Stone King to minister us in word. He is a man of faith who has a testimony that will inspire you and activate your faith. So you're on your feet, but let's put our hands to worship the Lord right now as the man of God comes to preach. God bless you. Would you do that for the Lord tonight with all of your might for just a moment? Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you because... You are God. There is unlimited potential 
in this room here tonight. Unlimited potential in this balcony, this main floor on this platform. As a point of reference, I want to read to you tonight from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. The setting here is that Jesus had just cleansed a leper, and the fame of him went abroad. If you look in verse 16 of Luke 5, it says, And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And look at this. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. To me, that's astounding, really. Then in chapter 6, if you look at verse 19, it says, And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Not six, not a half, a dozen, a dozen and a half, but everyone that was there was healed by the presence of this man called Jesus. So I want to entitle this tonight, Present to Heal. Would you lift your hands, your voices, and your hearts, and would you pray from the deep of you that God will do with you here tonight exactly what he wants to do? Don't worry about your neighbor. Just let your voice out. Jesus, tonight, by the authority of the Word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am asking, lift us into a realm of understanding and revelation. We will not fail to give you praise, glory, and honor. Anoint us here tonight both to speak and to hear. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you thanks. Blessed be the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I worship you, O Holy Father. Blessed be the name of Jesus. You may go down clapping. Would you clap uproariously for just a moment? Would you let your voice out? David of old said, clap your hands, all ye people, all ye people, and shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. And there is triumph in this house tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. October 6th, this year, this past year, I celebrated my spiritual birthday. I've had the Holy Ghost now for 50 years. And I've lived among you for 50 years. July 19th, this month, I was 74 years old. The word retirement is not in my vocabulary. As long as I have breath, a mind, I hope in the end result, if Jesus takes me again before the rapture, I die in the pulpit. What a tremendous way to go as far as I'm concerned. If you really have the truth, if you really love the truth, there's really no retiring from this. There's no retiring from this because there is something inside of us that transmits human logic and reasoning and understanding. There is a fire. There is an anointing. There is an authority that can never die. If you believe that, if that makes any kind of sense to you, do what you feel to do right now for just a moment. Because there is revelation here. 
There is understanding in this house. And I want to tell you tonight, because Jesus is here, anything can happen. I don't care what the doctor told you. I don't care what the prognosis is, and I don't care what the diagnosis is. There is a Jesus. He is the dear and glorious physician of his kingdom. There shall never be an end. There is no end to him. And when the doctor sends you home and says, you've got six months, you've got a year, get your house in order, there's another voice that says, try me, try me. His name is Jesus. You ought to shout that name for just a... Do it again. One more time. And you can feel the air tremble. You can feel the air tremble at the shouting of his name, at the mention of his name, because there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. I don't know about you here tonight, but I feel like shouting. I feel like dancing. I feel like lifting my voice. So once again, just do it however you want to do it. I have a tremendous burden in this hour to transmit what I have a hold of to everyone I can. I asked the Lord this year in particular, I said, Jesus, when I fell dead of a massive heart attack about 11 years ago in Sydney, Australia, and was clinically dead 45 minutes, there was no breath, there was no heartbeat. Nothing worked. They did resuscitation. They did CPR. They did 10 electric shock treatments to my heart. Nothing worked. The blood had coagulated my hands, my forearms, my feet, and my legs. I was just simply DOA, dead on arrival at the hospital. There was no hope for me at all. But Jesus stepped on board that ambulance on the way to the hospital and I later got this confirmed by the paramedic. I went back to Australia and talked with him. He said, Reverend, I've never seen anyone recover from what's happened to you. I said, well, what happened when you shocked my heart? He said, it would beat three or four times and stop. He said, nothing worked. He said, but in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, your heart began to beat on its own. Your breath came back. And I said, you know why? So you can't take any credit for it. Jesus. 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 I worship you. And so I reminded the Lord of all that this year. And I said, I was ready to go. But I'm back. What am I supposed to do? And then... They put stents in my heart after the heart attack 11 years ago as preventative medicine to prevent a further occurrence or a like occurrence again. And um, from the way they talked about these stents, I thought they were good for life. They put five stents in my heart just to open narrow places that they thought might cause another heart attack. I thought from the way they talked, the stents are good for life. They're not. They're only good for five years, and they don't tell you that. But I am telling you that. What happened was around every stent they put in my heart and the veins, scar tissue formed around the stents and they blocked. So I went in for a checkup, hadn't had one for two years. They did a complete thorough checkup and found that one vein on my heart was 100% blocked, another vein was 99% blocked, the vein on the back of the heart was blocked, there was no blood getting to the lower part of my heart, only the little vein on the front was operating. And the doctor said to me, he said, Reverend, he said, if you'd not come in here, we'd not found this. You might have lived six months, but you'd have dropped dead someplace. He said, 
I said, he's going he's, he's, he's to take surgery. I said, when could you do it? This was on March 12th we were talking. He said, we could do it tomorrow, the 13th. I said, all right. I thought, well, I'm here. I don't want to fly home and come back and all that business. I'll just do it while I'm here. I had no idea what I was in for. No one explained to me, gave me any kind of help at all about what I was facing with open heart surgery. And I'm sure that you know something about it, but it's the most invasive thing you'll ever have happen to you. But the next day, I was walking down the hall in the hospital. They didn't believe it. Nobody believed it. People, there is a God. There is a God. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's a healer. He made a body out of clay and he can repair it. And the doctors told me, they said, Reverend, we know your whole story. We know the miracle. We know everything. They said, but the biggest miracle in your life to date is that you lived 10 years on five stents with no medication. They said, that doesn't happen. It can't happen. But it happened for me. So I said, Jesus, I was ready to go last year when they did the surgery. What is the purpose of my being here? I want to know exactly what you want me to do. And I have come to believe with prayer and some fasting. I have come to believe that God has kept me alive to transmit what I know to the younger generation so that this truth is not lost for the next generation. People, it doesn't take two or three generations to lose the truth. It can be lost in one generation. If this generation does not see the demonstration of the Spirit of God in power, we're going to become just another religion. Something has got to happen among us. Something has got to happen among us. And it's got to happen now. Now is the moment. Now is the time. Now is the day for all of this to take place. And there is a hunger here. There is a hunger here. There is a hunger here in this place tonight. You can feel it. And God has come to meet that hunger. You're, some of you are going to walk out of here possessing gifts you did not walk in with. You're going to walk out of here with authority you did not walk in here with. You're going to walk out of here preachers with anointing that you did not walk in here with because Jesus is in this house. And I reiterate in your hearing where Jesus is, anything, anything, anything can happen. Clap your hands again and rejoice in that fact. Rejoice in it. So, I have begun to tell some things I've never told before. I've seen a lot of things in 50 years. And there's been a fight, but there always is a fight when you do something notable for God. It's amazing. It's really amazing. But greater is He that is within us than He that is in the world. This greater has a name. There's a lot said about the gifts of the Spirit. There's a lot written about them. There's a lot taught. There's a lot preached. But tonight, I want to talk to you about the gifts of healing and the gift of faith. They're listed among the nine gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The gifts of healing are what God does through us. The laying on of hands, anointing with oil, prayer lines, which is really one of our own traditions. You won't find prayer lines in the Bible. It's one of our own traditions, and it works because God has always met man at an altar of sacrifice. Whatever sacrifice you make, he'll meet you there. And God has honored our prayer lines. But the gifts of healing are what God does through us. Anything that God does through us is subject to error, and misuse. Any preacher who preaches very much will tell you there is the sermon he thinks he's going to preach, there is the sermon he does preach, and then there is a sermon he wished he had preached because it was flawless in its original inspiration from the Creator. But the t by the time it is channeled through this flesh and blood, it can become short-circuited. 
So anything that flows through man is subject to air and misuse, and it has, it's limited. But what I want to transmit to you tonight is this. The gift of faith is what God does without us. But he has to have a channel of relinquishment to flow through. That means when he walks in your services, you need to scrap your notes, your program. The choir doesn't have to sing at the appointed time. You don't have to take the offering at exactly 8.25. Take it 11 o'clock, they're all prayed through, you get more money. God is trying to get a hold of us in this hour. All over this country where I travel, God is pulling at preachers to get involved in the demonstration of the Spirit of God and power. It's a pulling against preachers because I'm telling you, if it is ever noised abroad out there that in your local assembly, people, blind eyes are opening, deaf ears are hearing, the lame are walking, cancer is disappearing. If it ever gets noised abroad outside these four walls that in this place, cancer disappears, tumors disappear, legs grow, a blind eyes see, you're never going to build a building big enough to house what's coming because this country is sick of religion. This country is sick of television. This country is sick of televisors and all of that televangelist. It is sick of it. This generation wants the real thing. They want the real touch of God. They want the reality of God. They don't want some surface situation. They don't want what I call sloppy agape. They want the real power and love of God. And I feel that real power and love of God in this place tonight. I can feel there's a hunger here. Something is about to happen. My prayer is that something will be born here tonight in this meeting that will never die that will never die, but it will spread. If you want that, in your way of telling God so, lift your hands and let your voice out. It's falling on some of you right now. That very answer is falling. Uh. Go ahead and clap. There's an excitement in this house. There is an excitement in this house tonight. Hallelujah! God has to have a channel of relinquishment that he can flow through. When I'm preaching, no matter where I preach, in this country, out of this country, my only goal is to connect you with Jesus. That's my only, that's my only reason to be here. That's my only reason to be in this pulpit, is to somehow help you get connected with Jesus. And there will be connections along the way as I'm preaching or teaching. But all of a sudden, there is that solid connection. Because the Holy Ghost knows the exact second when your heart and soul is ready to receive all that he has for you. And Jesus knows he can interrupt me any point of my preaching or teaching because when he walks in I have the good sense to know I can't compete with him and I can't upstage him you're not gonna upstage Jesus when the Holy Ghost sweeps in the best thing you can do is scrap your program get out of the way climb over the pews and go at it that is what the Holy Ghost is trying to get us into in this hour Connection. Have you ever watched a sunset? God did that without us. Have you ever watched the long fingers of dawn crawl over the mountaintops and illumine the deep recesses of the valleys in the morning? I have in the wilds of upstate New York, Adirondack State Park. I've camped there a lot through the years. The place where I used to go, I could drink the water over the side of the canoe. It's a spring-fed lake. It's a wonderful vacation. Disneyland is not vacation for me, it's purgatory. 
But where I go, there are no people, and it's a vacation. There's just nothing but the eagles, a few bears. The moose have come down from out of Canada, and uh, I'm a decent shot. I am a life member with NRA, and I was raised on a farm, and I know how to do it. The message here is, don't give me trouble. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> But what's interesting about all of this is that in the wilds of upstate New York, and at night, I mean to tell you, you wake up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and you can't even see your hand in front of your face. The black is so black. I mean, you can feel it. It's just so dark. And I have, on more than one occasion, awakened in the middle of the night like that, and one night in particular, I remember, and it must have been about, dawn hadn't even begun yet. It had to be somewhere near 3, 3.30 in the morning, something like that. And a bird began to sing. And I thought to myself, what is a bird doing singing at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning? And then one over here answered, I said, what is this all about? And I realized, the reason that bird began to sing in the darkness of the night is because there was something in the breast of that tiny creature that realized that light, dawn, was about to break. So I understand something, ladies and gentlemen. Faith is the bird that sings to greet the dawn while it is still dark. Let your voice out. Mm. Mm. Worship you, Jesus, because you are God. God did all of that without us. The lightning streaking through the clouds, he did that without us. Without us, anything that God does, without us, it's flawless. The gift of faith is what God does without us. When he sweeps in, I've seen miracles of healing. I mean all kinds of things have happened in 50 years that I've walked among you. But an astounding thing happened to me about a year and a half ago. God showed me something, and this is what he showed me. It's so apropos for this crowd here tonight. He showed me that people who come into our services are healed just by being in the presence of the Lord. In other words, this is happening here tonight. I felt that as I sat over there. There are some people here tonight in this audience, there's something lurking in your body. It wouldn't have come to surface for another six months or maybe a year, but because you have come into the sanctuary, of the Most High God, and you have worshipped Him, that thing has been taken from your body, and it will never, ever come. You'll never come down with it. That is shouting material. That is shouting understanding, because there are a number of you here tonight, because you dare to lift your hands, because you dare to lift your voice. God has already performed a miracle inside of you. If you can feel that, if you can feel that, if someone can feel that, you ought to shout for just a moment. You ought to let your voice out. You ought to clap your hands and rejoice. Oh. These are some of the things I've never told until now. But in some places where it's announced I'm coming to preach and minister, people begin to get healed before I ever arrive in the city. People begin to get the Holy Ghost before I ever get there. Faith begins to rise. This is what we're entering into at the end. This is where we've got to get to. We have to get beyond traditional Pentecostalism. We've got to become apostolic Pentecostals. That's what we've got to become. And that's really who you are. It just needs to be stirred up inside of you. 
until you become bold to demonstrate it. I walked into a service in Columbus, Ohio. I didn't go to the platform. I was speaking that night, but I just walked in and I stood here about five or six rows back from the pulpit area and I just slipped into a seat here because they were singing whatever. And I didn't know it, but three rows behind me, there was a seat on the aisle also. A crippled man walked in and stepped into that seat and looked up and saw me. And God healed him instantaneously. Faith just leaped inside of him. He walked out of there healed. People, it's not because I am who I am. It's because he is who he is. And I believe it. I believe in him. I am a believer. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. I've got that power. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I've got that power. I've got that power. As a believer, you've got that power. I walked into service one night late because the plane was late. And I walked down the middle aisle, had to, on my way to the platform. And I don't know why, I just felt as I walked down the aisle, people's backs were toward me, of course, but there was a man I was passing by him. He had a dark suit on. I felt to just reach over and lay my hand on his back and keep on walking. I didn't know it, but he had a terrible back condition. He was healed instantaneously when I healed him, when I touched him. I didn't know that until much later. People, if we ever wake up to who we really are and what we've got a hold of, if you, if you gentlemen, if you preachers ever begin to realize what it is that's inside of you, you will come out of your corner and you will make the devil wish he'd never heard your name. You'll make him wish he'd never got entangled with you because inside of you is the power to cast out devils, to lay hands on the sick, to drink any deadly thing. It will not hurt you. What an incredible insurance policy we are covered with and that is because we are apostolic believers. We are apostolic believers. I am a Bible believer. Shout, I am a believer. You may be seated. I hope this helps someone here tonight. I think it will. Last year, and this year also, two different preachers asked me, they said in conversations we were talking, they said, Brother Stone King, where did you ever get a hold of this? When did this all begin in you? And my answer was, I've always had it. <laughs> because I am a believer. I'm really no one special. I really am not. I'm just a real Bible believer. That's what sets me apart from others because they're not yet. You've got what I've got, but you've done nothing with it. That's good preaching, and that's free. That's not part of my notes. <laughs> Inside of you is a resurrection power. Inside of you is a power that can destroy. You and I can walk into any city and rearrange the devil's borders for him. We can walk in in the name of Jesus and we can rearrange his borders and push him out because we've got the power of the name of Jesus which he fears. Mm. When I first got the Holy Ghost, I had a very difficult time getting it because I was very shy. In fact, I never had a speech class in my life in high school. I lied out of every speech class I could get. I got out of it. I, I, I was terrified of, of speaking in public. I just didn't want to do it. You wouldn't believe that now, but that's how it was back there. I was a tap dancer in the theater. I was on my way to Radio City Music Hall for an audition. And um, I can still do it. <laughs> I know how to do it. And if you watch my movements, you can tell I know something about something because I don't have wasted movement. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> I got the Holy Ghost. And once you get the Holy Ghost, you can't lie anymore. So <laughs> I had to do some of this speaking. And it was, but once I got the Holy Ghost, something took a hold of me. Something had a hold 
hold of me, and it, there was a boldness that came on me. So I finally got the baptism of the Holy Ghost about, I don't know, 12 o'clock midnight, one Sunday night. I prayed so hard to get the Holy Ghost because I, I, what would happen is I'd get my hands up like this. See, when I, when I came into this, I was, um, I'm telling you this for the benefit of the visitors because I can relate to you so easily. I wasn't raised in this. And I know this is the most unusual thing you've ever been involved with here tonight. I know that if you're visiting. And the secret is, we're out to get you. <laughs> so if you're a visitor and you're wise, don't just sit there and do nothing. We know you're a visitor. Act like us. Clap. Raise your hands. Get involved. And if you clap and raise your hands, get involved, this thing will get a hold of you. Something will get a hold of you. And you'll never be the same again. You'll never be the same again because you can't be the same again, ever. Jesus. So I would come to the altar, and I was voted the best dressed man in the man in the Evangelical Free Church where I went. So I, w and we, I was in a basement in a parsonage. It was a home missionary setting. The church I went to had stained glass windows, a robe, choir, everything. And now I'm in a basement, cobwebs hanging from the ceiling, the altar where it was shook when you touched it. The carpet was worn out. It was unbelievable. <laughs> but if you closed your eyes, you didn't see all that. That's why you can have church down on the riverbank. You can have a building and not have a church. church is not a building. The church is people. Wherever you got two or three gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. And I'm talking to some of you here tonight. You don't need to worry about buildings and all of that. If you've got a move of God, you, this thing, eventually, this thing is going to go to the streets anyhow. Because what is marching down the road toward us, there's no building build enough, build, built big enough to house what's coming. This is a magnificent edifice. I've never seen anything like this. This is absolutely beautiful. But what's coming, this building is not going to hold it. Eventually, we're going to go to the streets. It went to the streets in the beginning. In the beginning, there were 50 thousand believers in Jerusalem. There were 50,000 believers in Antioch. There was no way to house it. That's how they shook the Roman Empire. It was Christianity that destroyed the Roman Empire because the lions couldn't eat it. The fire couldn't burn it. The walls couldn't hold it. It was like a forest fire out of control. And I can feel the sound. I can feel the that thing is coming back upon us in this hour. I can hear the sound of the rushing mighty wind. I can hear the crackle of cloven tongues of fire. Something is being born among us. Revival is not coming, ladies and gentlemen. Revival is here. Clap your hands and welcome it. So when I'd go down to that altar, I'd kneel down, crying and praying. This was major for me. This was major for me. This came much later. <laughs> In fact, the first time I came to one of these kinds of services, I, didn't, I couldn't figure out how in the world I'd gotten talked into coming. So maybe someone here tonight feeling the same way, but that's how I felt. I didn't have a car because I was going to Drake University studying commercial art at the time. And um, so these Pentecostals, they picked me up. Pentecostals do anything to get you. <laughs> they'll pick you up, they'll take you out to eat, they'll invite you to their home. And they, the service started, and I thought, if I ever get out of here alive, I will never be back. That's how I felt. I, I didn't get this business and all this. I didn't get that. In the Evangelical Free Church where I went, it started at 7 o'clock on Sunday night, ended exactly at 8. If you had a coughing spell, it could wreck the service. 
Here you could drop dead, nobody would even know it. They'd think you were in a trance. You had been slain in the spirit. And here you don't know what time you'll get out of here. So they used to, they'd get a hold of me when I was in the altar. They would loose my tie. They, they would massage my shoulders. I've never found a verse in there that says, this is what they do to help you get the Holy Ghost. That's what you do. And I had more hair then. They'd mess up my hair. And I'd wear the best clothes I had to that basement because I didn't want to offend God. You know, I wore the best. And every time I went home after church, everything went to the cleaners the next day. It was something. <laughs> but one night, I didn't care what I sounded like. I didn't care what I looked like. I didn't care. I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, October 6, 1963, and spoke with tongues for an hour and a half. I mean, it just poured out. It just poured out of me. <laughs> and that particular night, I had worn snow white trousers, a dark brown uh, sport jacket, and my best, and I was lying flat on my back on that cement floor in that basement, just speaking with tongues. You know, when you really get a hold of God, you don't care about anything else. And so, after that, I finally opened my eyes, and Brother Butcher, my pastor, was leaning over the back of the pew, looking down at me, and I said, Brother Butcher, I've got it. He said, I'm afraid you do, boy. Well, they took me upstairs and went over to the house to eat, you know, as we do. We have this tradition of eating after services. And I wasn't into it like I am now, but it was new for me. We went over. They asked me to say grace. I bowed my head and began to speak with tongues at the table. Well, they finally drove me home, and I got home about, I don't know, 1 o'clock in the morning, something like that. I knelt down beside my bed just to thank God for giving me the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues. So the next morning when the alarm went off to go to work, I just shut it off and waited till 8 o'clock and called the office. And when uh, they answered, I said, this is, uh, you know, Lee Stone King. I said, I'm not coming to work today. They said, are you sick? I said, no. They said, what's wrong? I said, you would never understand. I said, but I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> In other words, I had prayed so long and so hard to get the Holy Ghost that when I finally got it, I declared a national holiday for myself, and I stayed home from work and got paid for it. I got paid for it. I listened to Merle Ewing sing, Vesta Mangan. I spoke with tongues all day long. Wow. <laughs> so that morning, I was buying a home in Highland Park, Des Moines, Iowa at that time. And I was going on with my college, whatever. Anyway, uh, my landlord and his wife lived right around the corner from this house I was buying. And in those days, you didn't have to lock the doors. It wasn't like it is now. So I, I called, you know, I was so excited that I had the Holy Ghost. So I called right away after 8 o'clock and enjoying my holiday. And I, I said to this woman, the landlady, I said, Ethel, I said, God gave me the Holy Ghost last night. I've got it. And she, she said, what? And I said, I've got the Holy Ghost. Well, they were in the Evangelical Free Church, too. And they knew I was visiting some other church, but they didn't know what. They weren't real happy about it, but I was happy about it. So I got the Holy Ghost. And I said, I said, it's just the most exciting thing. She said, oh, Lee, she said, I am so sick. My head is splitting. I can't get my head off the pillow. She said, I am so sick. My head is throbbing. I said, I'm coming over. That's how you are when you get, first get the Holy Ghost. You don't care what they think. You don't care what they say. You don't care what they do. We hang around church two or three months, a half a year or a year, and we become mature. <laughs> no, the word is backslidden. You need to go back to the place where you first met him. You need to go back and stir up the gift that is inside of you. You don't ever need to fall out of love with him. You don't owe this world an apology for the way you act, the way you look, the way you worship God. You don't owe this world anything. They don't apologize out there for what they do, and we're not going to apologize in here for what we do. If God likes this holiness, we're going to be holy. If he likes this modesty, we're going to preach modesty. If he likes baptism in Jesus' name because it's in the Word, we're going to preach baptism in Jesus' name. If he wants us to speak with tongues, we're going to speak with tongues.
Christ. If he wants us to lay hands on for healing, we're going to lay hands on for healing. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. It's in the book. Clap your hands again and shout. Jesus. Oh. I ran over there. And, of course, the door was open. And I had been in the house. We, we were great friends. Ate out and all kinds of things. And I ran back. Where she was lying, she was an older woman. Her hair, that snow white silver hair, which is lying on that pillow. She was so sick. I said, Ethel, listen to me. I'm a Bible believer. I've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I read in the Bible, these signs shall follow them that believe. I can anoint you with oil and God will heal you. I said, have you got any oil in the house? She said, I think there's some Mazzola oil in the kitchen. He didn't say what kind of oil. It could be Quaker State, Penn State. It's not in the oil. It's in the name. That's where it is. Jesus. So I ran into the kitchen and ransacked the cupboards and found this big bottle of Mazzola oil. And I was nervous. It's my first debut, you understand? It's my first anointing. So I opened it and spilled it. I was anointed for the task, I can tell you. I ran back in that bedroom and I laid my hands on her head and I said, I command this headache and this pain to be gone in Jesus' name. That's all I did. I'll never forget it. Fifty years ago, this happened. She opened her eyes and grabbed her head. She said, it's gone. She said, it's gone. She said, it's gone. People, it's supposed to be gone when you pray in Jesus' name. When you lay hands on people in Jesus' name, Brother Hundley, something is supposed to happen. Something is supposed to happen. Everybody shout, Jesus. Jesus. Uh. Yes, sir. Yes. I knew then, I knew I had a hold of something. I knew something had a hold of me. I was not even eight years old yet in the Holy Ghost, and I was laying hands on people, and they were being healed. I got myself in so much trouble in Bible school because I taught personal evangelism there in school. Brother Norris hired me, and we had people being healed. I was telling Jonathan Shatwell this earlier today. I had these students that came from my personal evangelism classes, and we'd go out, and we would, we would walk from door to door in the snow, and all these kids were coming. And this one boy walked up to me, and he said to me, we had just started teaching, then we were going to go out and go door to door canvassing. We did it all the years I was in school. Anyway... <clears throat> This young man walked up and said, Brother Stone King, my sister's in the hospital. He said, we think she's dying. She's in tubes and wires. There's no hope. He said, I've just talked to my father before I came to your class. He said, could I stand in for her? Would you pray for me as if it was my sister? I said, yes, I will. You know I will. That boy walked down that little aisle, but maybe 25 or 30 students. He knelt down on his knees in front of me. I put my hands on his head and prayed in the name of Jesus and mentioned his sister's name. That boy was shaking and trembling and speaking with tongues, and we had a mover of God, and then went out and did our canvassing. That night, when I got to the church service, that boy met me in the lobby of that church. He grabbed me. He said, Brother Stone King, I called home. He said, my father is ecstatic. He said, what happened is my sister was in tubes and wires. He said, but what the doctors and nurses came running to her room and she had broken the tubes and the wires and was dancing in the spirit on the hospital room floor, speaking with tongues. That's the kind of power that we have a hold of. That's the kind of power that we have a hold of. That's what's inside of you. That's what's inside of you. That's what's inside of all of us. It's here in this place. And I got in trouble with the school because they thought I was trying to start a church within the church. I'm just a believer. Right. 
I've just always had a hold of it. People have said to me, well, are you surprised when they're healed? I said, no, I'm surprised when they're not healed because they're supposed to be healed. But on the other hand, for those of you who may get involved with this and have some what we call disappointments, this may help you. I have prayed for people all over the place in every situation, wheelchairs, you name it, hospitals, whatever. And I have prayed for people and nothing happened. And I've had preachers say to me, well, you prayed for them, they weren't healed, why not? I said, I don't know why not, I'm not God. He just said lay hands on them and pray. So that's what I do. Well, one night, I was preaching the gift of faith like it's here tonight. Swept in that place and a man in a wheelchair over here leaped out of a wheelchair and ran across clear over here and began to dance and shout. So I ran over there and began to dance and shout with him. The place exploded. All of a sudden, he stopped dancing and shouting and ran back to that wheelchair and sat down in that wheelchair. I thought, what's this all about? So I went over and got down in front of him and I said, what's wrong? He said, Brother Stone King, if they find out I'm healed, I will lose my government pension. I said, what? He said, if they find out I have been healed, I will lose my government pension. They wheeled him out of that service that night in a wheelchair because he'd rather be in a wheelchair than to be healed and get a job and make a living. He'd rather be in the wheelchair and get a pension from the government. That's happened three times in my ministry. I don't beat myself up anymore. I don't beat myself up anymore. There are reasons why people are not healed, and you don't know those reasons. People, we need to forget the minuses, what did not happen, and shout about the pluses, what did happen. That's our whole problem. That's our whole problem. We need to rejoice over what God has done. I don't always know why these other things don't happen. So don't be discouraged, young preacher. Don't be discouraged, pastor. Just keep laying hands on. Just keep anointing with oil. Just keep commanding in Jesus' name because he is the healer. He is the healer. He is the healer. There's revelation in this place. There's understanding in this place. Wonderful what I feel here. The revelation of all revelations that I've ever had from God along these lines of the miraculous, the gifts of the Spirit is this right here. It really changed my life. It changed my ministry. It was an event that happened. It had changed my approach to church. It really changed my approach to church. It changed my concept of how God heals. <clears throat> and it changed my awareness concept of God. And here's what happened. When I was pastoring the first church in upstate New York after I got out of Bible school in 1968, 67, I won a lot of Catholics, and I won a lot of young people. We turned the local high school upside down. I was dragged into the chief of police station downtown, <laughs> Schenectady. He said, Reverend, what are you doing over there? I had pitched a tent, and the whole neighborhood was upside down because we were singing and doing what we do at night and preaching, and things were happening, and guys came in to beat me up, and they came down about halfway and got to looking at me, and their knees began, it's one guy's knees began to shake like that, and they ran out. They had bragged outside, they'd come in and beat me up. And then they, they ran out with their knees shaking. Found out later, he had seen a tall white angel standing behind me. I may look like I'm alone, I'm not alone. <laughs> you are not alone! Ladies, when you walk the streets, you are not alone. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. If you understand what I'm saying, there'll be a boldness come upon you. There'll be a boldness come inside of you. We are never alone. I am never alone. I am never alone. You are never alone. I walked in that chief of police station downtown Schenectady, New York, 
He said, Reverend, what are you doing over there on that street corner with that tent? And I had taken with me a young man that had been delivered miraculously from drugs. It was back in the early 70s. His name was Tommy. I said, well, Your Honor, I said, I brought someone here that will tell you what we're doing. And Tommy told him, he said, I was hooked on dope. The school couldn't help me. My parents couldn't help me. Medical society couldn't help me. But I came to this man's church and have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, and I've been baptized in Jesus' name, and I am drug-free. Judge's hands begin to shake. I said, Your Honor, that's what I'm doing. I said, You couldn't help him. The school system couldn't help him. Parents couldn't help him, but this Jesus did. That man, that judge's hands were shaking. He said, Reverend, you've got to leave now. You need to get out of here. He didn't know what to do. He'd never felt the presence and power of God like we brought into his office. He said, I'll send patrol cars every night. I'll police the area. I'll protect you. We had police protection every night for I don't know how long, as long as we had that tent revival. People, if you just do the will of God, if you take care of his business, he'll take care of your business. And his business is so winning. But during that time, I won a woman, a Roman Catholic lady to the Lord. Her name is Nell Sawinski. She became a prophetess under my ministry. She was mightily used by God. And she got the Holy Ghost in one of our tent revivals out on Route 5 toward Albany, the capital. And the t we were home missionaries. The tent was old. It was dilapidated. We had, had rips in it. And one night as I was finishing, we had sawdust poured, you know, for the altar area. And um, as I was finishing, people came and Nell came. And she was standing over here. And she was just worshiping God, just praising God. And uh, there was a big rip in the tent there. And I just kept on ministering to the people, moving among them, and left the pulpit, went down, praying for people in my manner of doing things. I looked over, and she was gone. I didn't know where she'd gone. And somehow, I walked over there, and what I didn't know was the Holy Ghost had fallen on her. She was speaking with tongues, and she fell through that rip in the tent, and she was outside in the grass, laying in the grass. Just the toe of her shoe was sticking through the rip. And I climbed through the rip, and out here she's speaking with tongues. That woman sang in tongues for three days. Three days she sang with tongues and worshiped God. She called me one day, and this is what she said. She said, Brother Stone King, I have a friend. She's a Catholic. She's older. She's in the hospital dying with cancer. Would you please go pray for her? I said, of course I'll go. So I went. She was in a private room. When I walked in the room, it, it was really something. Because she was an older lady, and her neck was just, it was all purple and red and blue, and her arms, her hands. And it was just an awful, it was awful. And in my way of doing things, I got down on my knees beside her and I, I said, Mother, what happened to you? She called me Dear Reverend. She said, Dear Reverend, they took me in a room and this is where the, one of the greatest revelations I've ever got a hold of and how God operates and what we should understand. She said, they took me in a room and they gave me radiation treatment for the cancer that's in my body. She said, they put me on a, on a, on a table and she said, what they do is they slant the table. She said, there's a button on the wall. They push the button, and when they do, the rays, that cobalt, the rays shine through my body and burn out the cancer cells. She said, but they didn't get the table slanted right, and the rays did not go through my body. It just cooked my body. She was just cooked. But this is what she said. She said, when they push that button, she said, you don't feel anything. Everyone say, you don't feel anything. Say it again. You don't have to feel anything. When they pushed that button, those cobalt rays just shined through the body and burned out. Ladies and gentlemen, people, listen to me. When you entered 
those doors into this sanctuary tonight, you entered the greatest radiation room on planet Earth. You don't have to feel anything. When you come in those doors, you are in the presence of God. The rays of the Holy Ghost can shine right straight through your suit jacket, right straight through your dress, blouse, whatever, and burn out cancer cells, destroy disease inside of you. You don't have to feel anything. You are in the most powerful radiation room known to man on planet Earth. And while I'm speaking this to you, there's an understanding coming into some of your minds and hearts. Some of you right now are being treated by the Holy Ghost. The rays of the Holy Ghost are shining in through your body. There are people being healed right here while I'm preaching and standing in front of you because Jesus is in this house. Jesus is in this house. There's one right there. There's one right there. The healer is in the house. The healer is in the house. Does anybody feel just now you have been healed? Does anybody here just feel like you've just been healed, that something's happened inside of you? If you have, just shout with your voice for a moment. Yeah. This is the most powerful place you will ever walk into. There's, this is the most, Brother Carney, this is the most powerful place in this entire city. This is the most powerful place in this entire county because in this place, in this place, the healer. close with this. I think this is why I've said everything I've said tonight. I in my hotel room this afternoon I bring back tears and wept. I, I have such a burden for our preachers because I wasn't raised in this. Those guys out there can't preach. We have the best preachers in the entire world. You preachers, you men are the best preachers in the entire world. But there's something I want to do for you. You may be seated. About two years before Brother T.W. Barnes passed away, he met me, I met him about two months after I got the Holy Ghost in 1963 at a general conference. Uh, my pastor wanted me to stay. Uh, I went with them. They wanted me to see what I was into, so I went to the general conference. And um, the last night, they had this T.W. Barnes uh, scheduled to speak. I knew nothing about him. I was not raised in this. And so we went, and we sat about a third of the way back on the main floor. And when they introduced Brother Barnes, he stepped into the pulpit. I've never seen anything like this before or since, but when he stepped in the pulpit, full-grown men and women jumped to their feet in the audience, screaming, spinning in between the backs of the seats and people's knees, and fell in the aisles of that auditorium, receiving the Holy Ghost and being healed. And I said to Brother Butcher, I said, I want to meet him. And so Brother Butcher said, we'll wait for you. At the end of the service, I walked down the front to the front and up the steps on this side. Brother Barnes was over here talking to a preacher. He's back to me. And uh, he was very sensitive in, in the spirit world and very sensitive to human spirits. And when I put my foot on, the, on, on that platform and, st and raised up, he turned and looked at me. And I walked to him. And I extended my hand to him, and I said, Brother Barnes, I want to do what you're doing. 
And he said, boy, I will pray for you. And he did. He was like a dad to me. We talked about everything, anything, and I miss him. I really do. But about two years before he passed away, he called me one day. And this is what he said. He always called me boy. He said, boy, God is protecting you. I said, what do you mean? He said, I get phone calls here all the time in my office from people who have just been in services where you've been preaching. You never called them out. You never anointed them with oil. You never laid hands on them. But they were healed of cancer while they listened to you preach, or they were healed of this disease or that disease. I said, really? He said, yes. He said, God is protecting you because if it was noised abroad, all that's happening in your ministry, there would be a jealousy rise against you. He said it would make it difficult for you. So God is protecting you. He's doing these things almost inconspicuously, but it's happening everywhere. <laughs> so today, this is the second time I felt to do this. Today, while I was studying and praying, I said, Jesus, I want you to do something for me. I want you to go to every preacher that is in that audience tonight. And I want you to do for them in their ministries what you've done for me. That whenever one of our preachers stands in their pulpits preaching, people in the audience begin to be healed of cancer and diseases and all kinds of things begin to happen. So tonight, would you stand for just a moment? Tonight, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, preacher, such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, receive it. In the name of Jesus, receive it. In the name of Jesus, receive it. That's it. That's it. On this platform, such as I have in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, that when you step in the pulpit, your respective houses of worship, that people will be healed of all manner of disease in the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. God is moving. God is moving. You're receiving it. You are receiving it. Revival is upon us. When the city finds out what's going on in your church, you're not going to be able to build anything big enough to house what's coming. Let your voice out one more time and just receive what has settled down upon you. If you are in this house tonight and you fear that cancer is in your body, if you will lift both hands right now in the name of Jesus, that thing will disappear from you in the name of Jesus. If you fear that there may be cancer lurking in your body somewhere, lift your hands and begin to worship God. When you do, healing, that cancer will be burned out in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I command it in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's it. That's it. And if you do have cancer here tonight, if you are a cancer victim, if you will throw both hands in the air and let your voice out, that cancer will be burned out of your body right there where you are standing. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I command it. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, be thou made whole. Ah.
If you feel tonight that God has healed you, it doesn't have to be cancer. It can be heart disease. I've got all kinds of faith for people with heart difficulties. If you have got any kind of a heart condition at all, if you will just lift your right hand and begin to worship God, God will heal you right here in this atmosphere of healing. The healer is in the house. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, by the authority of the Word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Healing is sweeping through this entire audience it's in the balcony it's in the balcony there's something sweeping through right there right through there in the name of Jesus if you have need of any kind of a miracle at all just lift your hands and begin to worship God God is here to heal anything everything all things If you know that God has healed you, would you come just running to this altar and just lift your hands and praise God for the healing that has taken place in your body tonight. There are numerous healings, numerous miracles of healing that have taken place. That's it. That's it. Right there. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Just keep on coming. In the name of Jesus. By the authority of the Word of God. By the power of the name of Jesus. The healer is in the house. The healer is in the house. That's it. That's it. That's it. By the authority of the word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in this sanctuary tonight, if you're a believer, I charge you as a believer to get involved tonight. Get your hands on somebody. If you are a believer tonight, get your hands on somebody and begin to pray in Jesus' name. Just get a hold of somebody in Jesus' name and begin to pray. It will happen. You don't have to have me pray for you. It's in the hands of believers. It's in the hands of believers. That's it. That's it. That's it. Hataka taka shataka. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Hataka rashataya. Hataka varaka shataya taraka. If you've got sicknesses or diseases in the balcony, come down out of the balcony and just push yourself into the front. Healing, there's people being healed of everything. Cancer has disappeared out of people's bodies tonight. Hearts have been strengthened. Heart disease has been healed. You can feel it. It's in the air. It's in the very air. I'm just going to encourage everybody. Everybody in this audience, get a hold of somebody. Everybody, get a hold of somebody. Begin to pray in Jesus' name. And when you do that, there'll be the Holy Ghost will flow through you. The Holy Ghost will flow through you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. Taka shataka. People are receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost here. Wonderfully receiving the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's it. Just come closer. You wonderful people over here. Just push in. Just push in. In the name of Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, 
in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Keep on coming from the balcony. Keep on pushing from the back. There's plenty of room up here. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of If you have any sickness or diseases in this house, if you got them, I want you to come down to the front. Come on, I know he's all over the house, but you can go ahead. We got room, we want you to come. The power and the presence of the mighty king is in this house. The mighty anointing power of the Holy Ghost is in this house. Come on, you'll find someone to lay hands on you. Some of you as you're coming down, the power and the presence of a mighty king. It's beginning to rest in this house. Come on, God is blessing you. Come on, God is touching you. There's signs and wonders and miracles uh, that are happening in this house. Uh, If you need the Holy Ghost, you can receive the Holy Ghost.